Okay, uh, we just have two more lectures. Uh, uh, medium size one on part one of people there, and then lecture on the Webster readings number two. Uh, and that will be it. And you can use you can use the rest of your time uh, for team meetings or just run away, whatever you like to do. The uh, problem with this, this many people in this small room is, you know, with other classes, it was easier to sort of divide up and they weren't holding your team meeting right in the classroom. It's, it's a little tougher here. People Wear by DeMarco and Lister. If there are only two books I'd have you read, it's Mythical Man Month and this one. Uh, and the, the sad thing with both of them is that you'll find that a lot of people have heard of People Wear and most people have no idea, in the industry have no idea of its contents, beyond saying that open plan is, seating is bad, which is true. Uh, yes? Did you say, which one of those two would you say you recommend you the most? Boy, that's a good question, uh, because they really cover different topics. Uh, Mythical Man Month really covers some of the issues of schedule estimation and planning that tend to go wrong. Peopleware covers fundamentally two, pro two issues, well, fundamentally three issues. One, you need good people. Two, you need to build effective teams. Three, you need to give them a good environment in which to work. So they're really complementary to each other. In fact, uh, Brooks cites to Peopleware in the, his uh, later chapters, more recent chapters in Mythical Man. Uh, so they really do cover uh, Quite separate issues, so I'd, I'd say read both, quite frankly. Uh, the, and when, when the Mark and Lister, the first edition was published in 98, as I recall. Uh, and they spent, basically the background is that they spent decades going in to organizations that had trouble or failing projects, reviewing them, trying to figure out what was going wrong giving advice and having the advice ignored. Pretty much that describes my experience as a consultant, uh, with a few exceptions, but it's, it's pretty remarkable uh, how often I would go in, give a detailed, here's what's going wrong, this is what you need to do, and they'd say thank you, and they'd pay me, and then they'd go on doing just what they were doing before. Uh, I once had that happen three times in three years on the same multi-million dollar project. Uh, each time they thanked me, each time they ignored what I said, and a year after the third time, the project was shut down and abandoned, and the executive vice president over it was fired. Uh, it's like, you know, guys, I, I spent all this time telling you what to do. Okay, but this first point, this is so important. Projects seldom fail for technological issues. Software projects and indeed IT engineering projects almost always fail for personnel issues, sociological issues. As I mentioned, the seven deadly sins. Uh, the problems tend to be based on people performing or not performing, communicating or not communicating, uh, whether or not they can actually accomplish what they need to do or not. And yet, most of what we do in the industry, it's like, well, we have this, these great tools and this great methodology, therefore the project has to succeed. And it doesn't work that way. Uh, the project, great tools and great methodology tremendously amplify the productivity of good people. And by good, I mean qualified, talented, you know, educated people who can get the job done. Uh, they will do nothing to help with people who don't know what they're doing. And again, I repeat, and I say this with no animus, just observation, there's a tremendous number of people in the IT industry who really don't know what they're doing. Uh, you know, who's, were you the one pointing out trying to do the, the coding test and hiring people? Who was that? Oh, yeah. Yeah. Those, those yeah. There were a lot of applicants who either faked their resume or really, really glad it through. Oh yeah, that's that's well. That's sort of the scary part. Is there, there are a lot of people who can, in fact, glide through. Uh, 
<clears throat> we focus on the technical rather than the human side, not because it's more crucial, but it's easier to do. If we just fill out these forms, if we just had a stand-up meeting each morning, if we just use this nifty new technology, it will solve our problems. And the irony is with, with good, solid software engineers, you know, you can be off coding and assembly on embedded systems and you'll get great products. And with people who do not necessarily know what they're doing, it doesn't matter what you give them. In fact, it's, you know, it's, it's, it's a bit like giving razor blades to a kid at times. They can actually do more damage. Any observations on your own experiences out there in the real world on this? Have you seen this where you've been in companies or situations where there are problems with development and it really boils down to, to people or personnel issues as opposed to the, uh, and, and by the way, I don't just mean personnel, I don't just mean underqualified. A lot of it is managers who make unrealistic demands who focus on the technical rather and so on. Yes? The, the, the biggest lesson I learned from 340 was people problems are harder than <coughs> They are. If I had a great group, like four of them were, or three of them were coworkers of mine, um, and we still had a hard time, you know, we had duplicate work or work that wasn't done fast enough, other work that depended on it, people problems are harder. The team I assembled at Pages is the best group of engineers I've worked with personally, and we almost tore ourselves apart in, in ego and other problems. Listen. I was saying, um, I've had a problem with too few developers where the developers just all leave. Oh, yeah. And then like, there's too few people left over to actually get the work done. Yes. And that's, that's sort of variant on the Dead Sea, but it's, it's not that the people behind aren't good. It's just you just don't have enough people to do it. You can't it's a hire drought. them. Yeah. You can't find, it can be, it can very, be very hard to do that. There's a hand in the back somewhere that someone has. I thought I saw a hand. I was wrong. Okay. Part of the problem, and <clears throat> later in the Webster readings, there's an article that I co-authored with Ruby Rayleigh called The Longest Yard that talks about the fact that there is an industrial mindset among managers. Engineers are cogs. All we need are warm bodies and the right methodology and the right tools, and they will simply crank out the solution. That, of course, goes against what you learned when reading Armour, that there's a tremendous amount of discovery uh, and creative work and occasionally unproductive creative work that goes on. So management tends to see it like, you know, you, how many of you know how in and out is organized in terms of personnel? You have, you have people working at specific stations and they're focused on making what the, at that specific station really good. And it's very effective. I like in and out. It's very effective. There, there's actually a great book about it, about how their approach was developed and so on. And it's why you always see a line of cars waiting to go through in and out. Software is not hamburgers. <laughs> Soft, software software is, is vastly more complex. It is not subject to assembly line production methods, and yet a lot of management uses assembly line approaches to software. Uh, <clears throat> we have, as they point out, the common attitude that management provides all the thinking and the people underneath just carry it out. Managers say, code this, code this, make this happen, make this happen. And you say, but wait, this is good. Uh, don't tell me that. I'm looking for solutions, not problems. Just code this. No, you don't understand. This isn't going to work. Uh, I've watched my daughter Crystal go through this with a few things. So there's a pilot project that they basically was really your, your classic chewing gum and bailing wire to pull together the proof of concept. Uh, and they kept saying, we're going to have to go back and redo big chunks of this once we get this working. They got it working, management said, okay, now support 10, ten times customers. So no, you don't understand. It's barely supporting the customers now as it is. This technology we use to do this proof of concept will not support 10 times the customer base. Uh, and had a big fight with upper management to convince them that no, it's not going to work 
to try and leverage 10 times the, uh, the concurrent users on what we've, the foundation we've built here. Management office has the attitude that people are interchangeable parts and that their relations aren't important. Uh, in other words, and, and Mark and Lister will talk about this a lot, said you can create the proper situation for a team to gel, but you can't force it to gel. Uh, again, at Pages, I, I hired these outstanding developers, still friends with all of them, still some of the best developers I've ever known, but boy, we had some, some deep and bitter arguments going on, and I was at a loss, this is before we had a VP of engineering, and luckily one of the engineers on the team, Rick Gessner, had had some training in resolving conflict within teams. So I basically had him train us as a team as to how to raise differences and resolve conflicts, and it's pretty much what, what saved it. Uh, Stephen Covey, we're often too, that should be PH, we are often too busy sawing to sharpen the saw. The average software developer doesn't own a single book on the subject of his or her work, and hasn't even read one. That's what you will find when you get out there. Most people will not have read Mythical Man. Most people will not have read Peopleware. Uh, I have several shelves of books on software engineering, software architecture, software design. A lot of which I've read, some of which are sort of defensive, sort of like I need to have this on hand. But this has been my study for 20 odd years, is why projects succeed and fail. And the sad thing is, we, there's great literature out there, and no one buys it and reads it. Which is why I have this class. And why <laughs> First semester I taught this, I gave the midterm, and I was grading the midterms, and literally my thought was, my work here is done. <laughs> <laughs> I looked at the, the answers, it's like, Okay, well, here's this risk because Brooks says this here, and here's this at the Marco Lister site, and here's this. I thought, yes, yes, I would kill to have people out in the industry. You know, I those. <laughs> you're the ones I want to kill. See, the other 50%. I would kill to have people out in the industry who have this basic, simple understanding of these factors. And, yeah. and that's really the point of this class, is, is that. I want to send you out there knowing this stuff because you're going to run into it. Yeah? Would you say like the average software developer even has a degree? I'm just curious. An awful lot of them do, and we, we can talk about that and sort of the, the, the rise and fall. There's been three peaks so far in, in getting degrees. Uh, but part of the problem, I mean, there are two issues here. One is that, as I mentioned with Peter Lenz, degree doesn't always guarantee anything. Yeah, I would think if you had a degree, you'd at least read, read one book. Not necessarily. The, you know, and, and, I, and I say this with, with all due respect, I love this department. This is actually a great undergrad computer science department. Uh, and it's a great undergrad computer, computer science department because a lot of big name schools, their undergrad classes are all taught by graduate assistants. The professors are all doing research or acting as uh, thesis or doctoral advisors. Uh, BYU has always had a focus on undergraduate education and so on. But the reason I'm teaching this is that after Chuck retired, the department chair, Mike, basically said, we don't have anyone on the faculty qualified to teach this class. Uh, I said everyone pretty much is, they're all academic. They don't have, you know, they don't have all the war stories that I keep dredging up here. Hopefully I won't repeat the same story too much. Uh, <laughs> but but no, a lot of a lot of CS programs, and and this isn't a requirement, folks. This is this is a, an elective that you guys all chose. In my opinion, this should be a requirement, and frankly, it should be a 200 or 300 hundred level class. People should know well before their senior year. But this this is actually the advantage of having this being a 400 level class is that your attention is focused because you're all interviewing for jobs. And again, a lot of what we'll talk about. Especially with DeMarco and Lister, 
is, do I want to work at this place? What are the danger signs? <laughs> yes, and then over here. Uh, maybe I just speak for myself, but uh, this being an optional class, I think this is the first class where I've read a book only on the software engineering like, team type aspect or like <coughs> project development. All the other books or texts that I've read or anything have just been about data structures or how to use a language or something like that. Nothing in between. Yes. No, I agree. Jim, I couldn't tell how to you this. Scratching your ear. Any other? Yes. I feel like 340 was the technical side, and this is more of the personal side for working in industry. Yeah. That's my intent. I'm not familiar with 340 at all, other than just you know students coming in saying, oh yeah, we did team projects in 340. It's like a team project, and it's very, it, it's like focused on building massive things. Yeah. With object oriented design, so I feel like this is tackling the first. Like, this, 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 this is this is tackling the reality of working out in industry. It's like the last time they really trained. Right. Right. So. Uh, <laughs> You're not wrong. Oh, for the 340? Oh, yeah. For us, for us, that was compilers, which I think is optional as an undergrad. They don't offer it. They don't even offer it. Oh man, when I was when I was an undergrad, it was required. <laughs> Compiler building, and it was it was notorious as a, the the class that you dropped out of two or three times before you finished it. In fact, no, they still have lots of those. I I dropped out of it second semester of my senior year. Uh, so I actually walked, but had not graduated yet, and went off and did a, uh, actually I had some classes, spring term, went off to an internship at General Dynamics, and as <coughs> that was coming to a close at the end of the summer, I called up the department secretary, uh, because I was going to come back and take 431, I still remember the number. Bill Hayes taught it. Uh, and, uh, uh, I talked to Janine, the department secretary, and said, you know, I need to know some details because I've got to come back and take 431. And the first time, I thought you graduated. I said, no, no, I dropped 431. And she said, yeah, I know what that is. Uh, and she said, hold on a second. And she put me on hold. And she came back a few minutes later. She said, I talked to Bill Hayes. He waived the requirement. You're going to graduate in August. <laughs> yes. <laughs> I have actually... I felt vaguely guilty ever since that I never came back and I actually finished work. It's kind of, you know, I, I should have done that, uh, but I didn't. Anyway, so yeah, this is this really is the, the purpose of this class is to prepare you to work out in industry uh, and to get the sense of what you're going to face when you get out there. One of the reasons I like to bring my daughter Chris in is because she graduated three years ago now from the U and has been working in industry up at Point of the Mountain. And she'll come back and say, oh yeah, this is what I thought back when I was an undergrad and here's the, here's the reality of actually working in a, in, in a successful and actually a pretty nice company to work for, all things considered. What is it? Uh, Solution Reach. Okay. It's a company that does uh, web, uh, it's web portal helping dentists and ophthalmologists and others manage their customers. They can set appointments, they can message back and forth, so on and so forth. Solution Reach. Uh, okay. The NOA is free. They're quoting a Billy Joel song, uh, basically talking about uh, what's the point of working 90 hours a week if, if you know, you lose your health, you lose your family, uh, you lose things that are really important. They talk about the fact that real world management, and, and some of this has sort of gone out, but not as much. That uh, real world management too often is about getting people to work harder and longer at the expense of their personal lives. Uh, when I was an undergrad, how many of you had a class from Robert Burton? I had five classes from him. <laughs> I was considered glutton for punishment. Uh, anyway, but but I still have a, I still have a good relationship with him. I, I saw him I, I saw him here a semester before last. I haven't seen him since. I don't know if he finally retired or not. Uh, but when I was an undergrad, he gave the honors program annual lecture, and it was a talk. If I can dig it up in my files, or if I can track him down, see if he's an electronic copy, called the Many Headed Beast on the Three Legged Stool. And what he's talking about is 
we go out into industry and we're dealing with family, we're dealing with our personal ethics, and we're dealing with work. And what we find is that we are sometimes competing against people who are willing to sacrifice their family and their personal ethics to get ahead and work. And we may forever be at a disadvantage as long as we value family and personal ethics. Uh, you will have managers who will, who will, you know, like, no, I don't, I don't care if your kid's sick. I expect you in here at work. Uh, beyond that, overtime, you know, working 90 hours a week and loving it. One of their key arguments is you really only get about 40 hours of useful work out of a person. And if you're having their, them there 90 hours a week, chances are most of the rest of the time is spent doing other things. It's either less effective programming, checking emails, meetings, whatever. Uh, I like one of the local companies has a billboard in I-15 that, and this is nice to see this attitude, where they said, you can code and still go home to your family at night. Make it 40 grand a year. <laughs> well, yeah, they pay 40 grand a year, okay. On the other hand, Crystal, <laughs> I, when my daughter Crystal spoke here a year ago, I taped it and I didn't post it publicly because uh, one of the people asked, well, how many hours a week do you work? Or how many hours a day do you work? She says, well, actually, you know, I work from home two or three days a week. And so she says, that's probably average about six hours a day. I thought, Chris, you don't want your manager hearing that. I mean, she's still getting everything done, which is what they should care about. Uh, on the other hand, she talked about the fact that they had gotten in a new CEO who was suddenly saying, we want all our engineers here at 8 a.m. every morning. As you will see, that is literally an issue straight out of people there. Uh, Programmers don't know that time exists. Yeah. Well, you know, at Pages, we had, there was a group of four of the engineers who would take these two-hour lunch breaks. And this, the COO, chief, or the C, CFO, uh, who's a good man, John Curry. I learned tremendous amount from you. But he came to complain. I said, you know, these, these guys are taking two-hour lunches. And I said, John, they come in at 9 and they're here till 9 p.m. at night. I don't care if they take two-hour lunches. <laughs> they're putting in long, you know, they're here 12 hours a day and they're getting their work done. And they're usually going off to lunch and talking through the issues they have. Uh, people who are being required to work, now it's possible to work long hours and be productive. I have worked long hours and been productive. I have. It's hard to keep it up. You can burn yourself out. Uh, the, uh, particularly if you're not clear, if you're, if you're not clear that you're actually being adequately uh, given credit and or compensation for it. But in most cases, if there is a requirement to work long hours, to work overtime, people, you get less quality, people are more unhappy and are more likely to leave. Observations, feedback, personal experiences? Um, just kind of what you were talking about, of not getting feedback, not getting good feedback. What would you say if you, you're like in a, um, managerial position where what you need is some personal validation of how you're doing but say your manager is only the person who focuses um, managers that focus just on the issues not on the people yeah I mean, what do you say to the manager to get them to... Well, uh, just what, what, does that, <laughs> what does that say about that company? Even. Well, it, 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 says, it, it says more about the management because you'll find the wide variety. I've, I've worked in situations, particularly some larger companies, where there have been, you know, as at, when I was consulting at Fannie Mae, I was over about 20, 25 consultants who were there to help out with various projects. And I was, my, my direct report, basically, the parallel person was Carol Teasley. Uh, who is, her title was VP of uh, Object Technology at Fannie Mae. Uh, still one of the most, single most competent people I've ever worked for. I mean, she was, uh, she didn't put up with any crap. She was tough. Uh, 
she had a plastic rod in her office that said the beatings will continue until morale improves. Uh, and I would walk over coals for her because she valued the good people who worked for her. She would go to bat for you. Uh, and uh, we still remain friends 20 years later. Uh, and I would, you know, in a heartbeat, she called me and said, Bruce, I've got something I'm doing here. You know, can you come join us? I said, sure. Uh, so, and that was in an organization that had a lot of dysfunctional managers in it. <laughs> so, so it's, it's part of the issue is that it's very possible for managers to get into place and you can have sort of the dead sea effect with managers as well. That some of the good ones tend to evaporate over time or they tend to gather, uh, you know, they have their own little groups but they spend their time defending it from other groups. Uh, you can have a lot of kingdom building in organizations which is where the status of the manager is based on the number of people she or he is managing, <coughs> not on actual effects and results or or sometimes it's only effects and results. It's like, yeah, we you know did this to our bottom line, but you know I lost three of the best coders I have. But hey, who cares? Three people. So I, I, I wish I had an easy answer for you, and and I don't. Yeah. It's it's sort of a real you know reality. I had one job I quit. It's a dream job, working on space shuttle flight simulators at NASA. That I quit after six months because the management there was so dysfunctional and frankly so awesome. Yeah. I have a family member who, them and their co-workers, anytime the, their manager uh, changes a job and goes somewhere else, they all follow. Uh, oh, yeah. to stay there because they like that manager specifically. Yeah. Well, I, Carol and I worked together a few other times, again, in a consulting role. Yeah. So, where do the good ones always go, like the Dead Sea Effect? Uh, they go to organizations that, that prize good management over effective management. Uh, yeah. By the book management. Yeah. Would you say those kinds of organizations were that attract good developers kind of stay the same over the time, or they kind of fluctuate over time? Or? You know, they're they're and, and we're getting some real issues here. And I can I can talk at great length about startups and what happens with startups, uh, and the founder effect and so on. You get this, startups often tend to collect really good people and things go well and so on. And as they become successful, uh, you get funding in and then backers want to bring in professional management and all the good people say like, no, I'm out of here. No. Uh, I had a situation at Pages where uh, when we were trying to raise venture funding, we had a, a venture capitalist bring in a temporary CEO. This guy had been a VP at Digital Equipment Corporation for 17 years and so on. Uh, and there was some good stuff he did, but frankly, he created a hostile work environment. Uh, and I was, you know, I was, I was the lead technical person. I was the chief architect. I was the one who hired all the engineers and everything else. And I had uh, Robert Kibble, who was a venture capitalist, approach me and said, you know, we're closing on venture funding. We're trying to make a decision about the CEO. I said, how would you feel if we kept Roger Cady? And I said, I would leave. <laughs> I was that. It was that blunt. I said, I could not work under this man. I said, it, is, it has been a challenge to work under him for the time we've had to, but I've you know, been willing to commit myself to the company that much. But I said, if you made a permanent CEO, I'd, I'd be gone the next day. Uh, and they didn't hire him. went and found someone else, Larry Spellhawk, who Larry and I bumped head a few times, but, but I have great respect for Larry. And I thought, all, all things considered, he did a great job. Anyway, so yeah, something, we're, we're back to the dictum I mentioned a week or two ago. You know, if you want to make change in an organization, you have to go unprepared to be fired. Uh, but ideally, what you, you don't want to go in and get fired, which ideally what you want to do is if you decide it's not going to change, you go find another job. While you still have your current job, it's much easier to find a job when you were employed. Employers do not like unemployed people. Pro tip. It is. No, it, it's, it's an easy screen. Oh, if you're unemployed, then no one must like you. So whatever you say in your resume, you know, why should we hire you? So it's, it is far easier to get a job when you have a current job. A few of my sons-in-law have not always done that. They have, have basically gotten themselves fired in a huff because of idiocies they saw their companies and found that 
It's much harder to get a second job or a subsequent job. Okay, qual oops, <laughs> obviously I didn't change the capitalization here. <laughs> Quality of time <laughs> permits. <laughs> Uh, that's because the prior format I had, the titles were in all caps automatically. You didn't have enough time to check. And I, I didn't, <laughs> yes. <laughs> which is, which actually, yes, this is very ironic for this slide. Uh, or fitting, however, whichever one you want to call it. The, uh, there is work I have done I am very proud of. Uh, I still get emails probably at least one a month from someone who says, I played Sundog as a kid, it was great. My favorite email was one I got several years ago from someone who said, I almost flunked seventh grade because of your game. <laughs> 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 no higher praise than that. No, I'm glad you passed seventh grade, but no, that's great praise. Uh, you know, I'm very proud of what I did with Sundog, very proud of what I did with Pages. Uh, but sometimes what you will find in organizations is that they will push you to push out crap. When you tell them it's crap, they said, we don't care. We're releasing this. That is a great way to demoralize your workforce. People will get fed up and they'll leave. They don't want their names attached to that. At least the good people don't. Yeah. So I think the book mentioned like some Japanese companies have a policy of like even developing teams with power over release dates. Oh yeah. What do you think about that? Oh, I think that's excellent. Uh, that's that's how you get high quality. On the other hand, ironically, Japan is not noted for a lot of leading edge software products coming out of it. Okay. Outside of the game industry. <laughs> uh, the uh, and and one can talk about there is a fine edge there between. Uh, waiting until every last bug is out and simply deferring defects and shipping stuff. But quality is, is and I will talk about quality often because it is sorely neglected in the software industry. We have amazing, excuse me, amazingly bad software out there. Uh, because they'd rather just ship it and deal with, with bug complaints. There are things that Microsoft Word, I've been using Microsoft Word for 30 years. Uh, true fact, it, it, Wayne Holder and I did the first integrated spell checker for Microsoft Word. We had a standalone spell checker because that's how spell checkers worked back in the early 80s. And Microsoft had us uh, develop it for their, to be integrated in Microsoft Word. So I've been using Microsoft Word for 30 years. There are still bugs that are there, which I've seen for 30 years. It's like, guys, seriously, you can't fix this? An oh, uh, formatting of paragraphs carrying over uh, so that if you, I've got a paragraph in one format and I've got a paragraph at the, the uh, in a different format at the start of the next page, like a page break there, and I'll, do, I'll delete the final paragraph on the previous page and suddenly it'll change the format of the paragraph on the next page. Okay. It's like, seriously? Seriously? I've been dealing with this for like 20 or 30 years. Uh, Observations on quality. Yeah. Oh yes. Uh, I've noticed. Uh, I've noticed that a lot of places that have lower code quality also have, also tend to not have like strict coding standards. Yep. So like formatting standards and lim yep. limiting standards. I think there's a direct correlation between. Quality and linting. Oh, there is. Uh, hang on a second here. Uh, I'm going to get to this at some point. I've, I've actually considered this tends to be a lecture I do later. Uh, but once this, oh, it's got there. Uh, let's see here. There we go. I, you'll find that I am a staunch advocate of quality assurance. Come on. I think we can see it. This for me is quality assurance. 
Uh, it is a whole set of practices and standards wrapped around your process activity, whether that's your requirements, your schedule, your design, the code. It includes the methodology you choose, the guidelines and standards, coding qualities and standards, the expertise you bring to bear, key values of the company. Uh, you have metrics, reviews, and testing to evaluate the quality of it. Based on that, you file stuff to defect and feature management to improve the process and deliverable and use configuration and lease management so that you can decide what gets you know cycled back for another round and what actually gets released. So the, the short answer is yes. There's a whole set of activities far beyond testing. Testing, as you see, is one little box here. Everything else here uh, that's not yellow is a quality assurance activity. Uh, and this is how you improve the quality of systems. Uh, at Pages, one of the things I did is I, I developed a set of coding guidelines. Uh, and there were a few of the engineers who didn't tend to follow them, and I would go through and reformat their code uh, and bring it up to the coding guidelines. At Airink, when I went in there, they, they were, these were all C programmers who were learning C++ on the fly while trying to code. Uh, and one of the first things I did was a uh, coding guidelines and standards. Okay, let's... A lot of, that's actually, can be an automatic check a lot of times. It can, yes. Version yeah, you've got, you've got lots, lots of tools that will do great stuff if you'll just use them. Parkinson's Law, this is often, the, the point of this chapter is they're using this. Parkinson's Law says that work expands to fill the time allotted. It's actually from a humorous piece. It wasn't an actual study. Uh, and, develop, and managers will use this to say, yeah, we have to pile stuff onto the coders. Because otherwise, if they have less to do, then they'll just you know, take their time and be leisurely. My experience with those coders is they want to get their work done and move on to the next thing. Uh, the last thing you want to do is give them busy work to fill their day. <clears throat> Laetrile, their chapter on Laetrile is the equivalent of no silver bullet. Uh, Maybe, how many of you know what Laetrile is? It, it was actually apricot, extract from apricot pits that was supposed to cure cancer. Uh, but only if you're in Mexico. Yeah, but only if you're in Mexico, you go to Mexico to get it. Uh, the problem is that you, and again, this is the same thing, you know, you changing languages or methodologies will give you huge gains, you need to double productivity, you should automate away your developers, AI is going to replace all the developers. I'm sorry, no it's not. Uh, it's just not going to. I, I, I now have a standard. There is some true AI development going out there, but boy, it's become a big marketing buzzword. And I finally, out of, I finally developed this. 90% of what you see in the press talking about AI, this is what you're getting. Some coders' algorithms with bugs. You know, this is this. This is not take anything away from, say, the deep mind stuff. Uh, but even a lot of machine learning is not AI in the sense of emulating human intelligence. It is just doing very rapid learning and reprogramming uh, based on data and feedback. Uh, Huh? Would you be okay if you took a picture of this? Oh, I'll send it out. Okay. I'll, I'll, I'll mute this out of the group. Lovely. Because I, I keep seeing stuff on Twitter. What does AI mean for your business? And I'll respond and just attach that. Uh, <laughs> uh, and, and, and it's important to note because, and again, if I had finished my master's degree, I would have, it would have been in AI. This is one of my favorite fields. I've got two shelves of books on AI. I think it's a great field to study. But most, right now, AI has sort of replaced the cloud as the current business hype. Instead of saying, you know, to the cloud, uh, or whatever, and of course I've got another one that says, do I have it in here? So the cloud is just somebody else's yeah, computer? Yeah, I don't have it here, but yes, I do have that, I use that one. There is no cloud, it's just someone else's computer. Uh, or in some cases, someone else's virtual machine, which is just a virtual machine running on someone else's computer. Okay. Uh, we actually have one more lecture, but 
We already talked about your assignments. Uh, part two in Mark and Lister, Webster Readings 3, one podcast. Your, you can resubmit your org chart and roles and responsibilities, but frankly, guys, it all looks fine. In fact, Ty was asking me. He said, how do you want me to grade these? And I said, they all look fine. <laughs> so you guys are getting up. Uh, and part of it, no, no, we're not done yet. We have one more lecture. I, I heard you. I heard you. Everyone's like, yeah, hey, just grab our stuff. Yeah, don't grab your stuff yet. Yes? So is this the first week that we need to get the seven hours? It's not. This is the first week in which we'll probably come close to putting in seven hours. If you're doing requirements, I suggest you get together as a team today, divide up or via you know, Slack or email or whatever you're using. Divide up roles and responsibilities as to who's going to write what requirements for each of your areas. It would be good to have people who are responsible for the areas writing requirements for those areas. Uh, and then have your project manager and or chief architect work together to you know, shape this into a document. Uh, let me pause and then restart. <coughs>